is the way I know my mic is on. So. Well, first of all, I want to welcome all of you. I have to tell you that it's a real privilege to uh, be here. Um, for the last 13 years, I've been doing live interviews all around the country and uh, have been blessed to meet some wonderful, wonderful entrepreneurs. And today we're going to explore the journey of a really few wonderful people. I'll forget about those that are making a difference in the world of entrepreneurship. And uh, little by little, uh, over my 30-year journey, I have actually seen uh, what I'm going to call a very large movement, uh, almost so what we could call it uh, the purpose-driven economy, where uh, entrepreneurs today more than ever are recognizing the need to not only build a business, but build a business that matters. And uh, my three guests uh, not only clearly get this, but they're leading the way. Uh, to my left, actually, is uh, David Murphy. And uh, David uh, actually went to uh, Notre Dame um, as an undergraduate. And uh, then he went on to get a degree in economics from uh, Dartmouth. And uh, during uh, his uh, early part of his career, he did lots of things. And uh, he was involved in a business plan contest and uh, ran across uh, three entrepreneurs that uh, obviously he thought there was something really there. And I believe it was in 2004, we actually joined them. And he's been leading uh, really an incredible, incredible um, business. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, his uh, company and, and what he's doing. And um, Laura uh, Hodgson is actually a graduate of uh, Georgia Tech. Um, Laura actually, you clap. <laughs> Laura actually was an aerospace engineer and uh, actually was on the track team there. <laughs> actually was on the track team as well. Uh, she went on to go to Harvard and got her MBA there. And um, she's been a serial entrepreneur. She's done many things, including her latest venture, which we're going to explore as well, called Nourish. And uh, my last guest is actually a Scott Shipwell. Uh, Scott's the one guest uh, out of the whole group here that I've known for decades. And uh, to watch him grow and mature and to see the things that he's done has been a real gift to me. He currently is the CEO and chairman of a company called Ascent, based in Roswell. And uh, that company uh, provides a software, especially for uh, special ed space. Um, he also um, has uh, used Ascent as a vehicle to not only create the Ultimate Life Institute, which is within Ascent, but more importantly, a foundation called the Magic Wand Foundation. And when you know Scott and his journey, he's all about the youth entrepreneurship. Now, one thing in this introduction I didn't do was uh, go through um, in the New York Times, in the um, Wall Street Journal, on CNN, because the accolades of what all these people have accomplished, the interview would be over. So um, all of that that uh, you can get from the company websites or the handouts that, um, that went to out today. The key to Let's Talk Business Live actually is you. And um, at a certain point into, into this, about 45 minutes, we're going to open this up to questions and answers. Because one of the things I'm a big believer in is OPE. Uh, not OPM, not on people's money, which is a pretty good uh, strategy for an entrepreneur as well, but OPE, which is other people's experiences. And I want you to have the chance to uh, learn about uh, their journeys uh, and, uh, more importantly, uh, some of the good things and some of the bad things. So uh, welcome to Let's Talk Business Live. David, one of the things that I thought would be a natural question to start off with you, and as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to let David talk a little bit about the journey, but um, you know, you're running, obviously, uh, you know, Better World Books, and um, if the audience doesn't know, in 2010, they did $45 million. Uh, they have raised over $9.5 million, yes, $9.5 million for uh, funding uh, libraries and literacy programs and um, much, much more. And um, I thought it'd be great for you to talk a little bit about how you got started with these entrepreneurs, you know, what made you want to be the CEO, and I think what would be very valuable is to talk about what a social entrepreneur really is. Sure. Um, I want to try. That works or not. Yes, you'll be okay. No. I'll just talk loud. Is 
Laura went to tech, she's going to figure this out. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think it is a journey. I think it's a great way to describe it. Um, you know, even as recently as maybe a decade ago or seven or eight years ago, if you told me I'd be sort of sitting here talking to you about mobile books or about these other great companies, um, I, I'm not sure I would believe you. So it is a journey. You never kind of know what's around the corner. But a couple things. Um, you know, I think the, and I was, while I ran into these three young guys who came, who were true entrepreneurs who came up with the initial idea for this, I was into this really, really early with them. Part of that was because I was an entrepreneur prior to that. So I've been sort of in and out of both the, I guess you could call it the corporate world, and then sort of jumping out and starting my own organizations and selling them and kind of keeping going um, as well. So I think part of that is it attunes you over time a little bit to spot opportunities. Um, and just always have your, kind of your antenna out. So I was here in Atlanta. I was a partner of a small private equity firm. And I was, uh, as we were mentioned, we were, um, I had, uh, back in about 2001, agreed to be a judge um, for a, a business plan competition process at my own mater, which is my family. I've actually jumped in and joined the tech world in that regard for the last couple of years. Um, and actually, have been exposed to business plan competitions all over the country, in Berkeley and other places. So um, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great learning process for me along the way. But um, in that capacity, you know, you're a judge and you get the business plans served up to you and you look at them. And um, this was when I saw back in 2003, I think it was like February of 03, and it was, it was three guys who kind of came up with this idea that maybe there's some value in used textbooks on the campus, and maybe there's an ability to sell them online in places like Amazon and Half.com, which I think back in 2002 was really just sort of fully became capable because Amazon had switched their business model to allow a whole third party marketplaces to evolve and essentially serve or sell product on their backbone. Jeff Bezos started Amazon in the 90s. The vision was really he was going to own it all, all the inventory, all the media product, all the books, and everything where he had. His warehouse is selling to you. Um, but he had new books he didn't have used. And over time, um, he was almost going broke. They were running through cash. And they built out this whole infrastructure. They said, well, wait a minute, what cash? There are people all over the country who have used books. Why not just let them sell on our exchange? We'll take a fee. And then they have the other people up to fulfill and do everything. So, so that sort of made it possible for not just a company like Bevel Books, but for lots of you know um, people in the media space, the media product space at that time, to kind of jump on and, and uh, take advantage of sort of windows to the world, if you will. So we had eyeballs across the world through Amazon to, to sort of sell your product if you had the right inventory. So that's how it started, and it really didn't start with this grand vision of, of a social enterprise that could generate um, in a, in a for-profit model, generate enough revenue and profit to self-sustain, let alone raise the money for the literacy partners, but we really just kind of started off as a, hey, let's help this literacy, this little um, sort of community learning center, literacy center down the street in South Bend, Indiana. Let's just run a book drive on Notre Dame's campus, get a bunch of books, sell them online, and we'll just give them the proceeds, we'll give them most of the proceeds when we're done, and we really just thought it was kind of a, a nice thing to do, but um, it went very well and raised money pretty quickly for them, and then the sort of first, I think the first true entrepreneurial light bulb went off where where the founders said, there's like 3,800 college campuses across the US, and this is really just the beginning. And, and there's really an opportunity here for what I call disruptive force, which is what entrepreneurs really kind of look for. You know, is there, is there some aligning of the stars here between technology and an industry shift that would pretend a, a, a big opportunity to kind of look at it at a macro level? And I don't have to tell you, this would be sort of, you know, preaching to the choir, but you know, for, for years, certainly going back to when we were in school, I mean, the bookstore had it, right? I mean, it was, you know, you went to get your, you got your courses, and you had to go buy your books, and there was kind of one place to get them. And then if you wanted to sell them back, you had to kind of take what the bookstore was offering, which was too bad for you. Um, and the internet began to kind of level play, you know, said, well, I'm going to go for that, and I'm back in the 2002 period. So we saw that, I saw that, and I love the opportunity, and really just began to be to kind of mentor them and, and you know kind of get them off the ground. It's interesting, um, you said that that uh, you know to want to be the CEO of Federal Books. It was kind of funny, as I really didn't want to be initially. I was really just helping. But what was kind of the interesting part about that is I'd worked with them for about a year, year and a half. We've gone through a lot together. You get to know people pretty long, a year and a half, and you 
know, their values, their ethics, um, you know, how they want to conduct their own business, and also what's your vision for the business down the road. And when I had suggested to them, I think it was in about the spring of 2004, that, hey, you guys have hit kind of a wall, the proverbial wall, when you start a company, which is if you really want to scale it, you've got to think really smart about leadership in the company. I really felt they needed a CEO, and I felt they needed capital, you know, they needed access to, to that next round that was going to start propelling um, to get the scale. And when I had suggested that, um, I really, I had already actually done some homework and had some candidates that I thought might be great CEO for. But I knew kind of my Rolodex, so to speak, people out of the book world, the publishing world, certainly not me. And, and um, they said, hey, we've been thinking about that too, and you're absolutely right, you know, we need to CEO. But it was really more of sort of kickback to me, like, we think it'd be great if it was you. And I said, well, no, I'm, I live in Atlanta, I have a job. Um, and we just we kind of went from there, and, and it really made, ultimately, when we talked about it, it kind of made sense. And so I decided to jump in and sort of help take the reins with them very, very early. Processes when we had six employees, and we we're still very much in the main You're about 190 employees now? Uh, a little over 400. 400? Yeah. Wow. Um, Let's say it's still over 100 well. But, um, so I guess the lesson all that for me might just be, you know, no matter what age you are, um, this, this happened to be in my sort of early 40s or so, and, and you know, once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur, I think you're just, like I said, you're in town, I guess, pretty finally Tune and you're just you're looking for opportunities and listening. And sometimes it may just come in the form of people asking you for help on something, which is really what happened here. Um, and you know, if you're if it's the right time and it's something you think you want to do, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to jump in with it and then help essentially with another group, you know, build something to really to scale, build something that's great. So sometimes you don't always have to be the person with the idea right from the get go. You can come in very early on them. Have the support um, that they're going to need, the other person, um, the person with the product idea that has no idea how to bring it to market, or vice versa. So to speak, uh, you know your business, and, and sometimes it'll be a nice match for you to jump in and, and do something. And they have been making a lot of things happen. Uh, if you get a chance, you go to uh, betterworldbooks.com and you'll get a good sense for this company and all the good that they're doing. and. Uh, it's, uh, I really commend what you've done, especially uh, really doing something that does matter. Um, Laura, I thought it would be great, very similar to David, to talk a little bit about you know, how you got here. Um, as I like to say, you know, people that know me well know I like to use this word, the beast. Laura and Scott are, are the beast. They, they are the serial entrepreneurs who see needs in the marketplace. And uh, more than ever, not only see needs, but uh, want to use these businesses as vehicles to do something that really matters. Uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about your journey and why you started Nourish, and more importantly, some of the things that you are doing. Okay. Well, um, I, I guess the journey to Nourish and the journey to entrepreneurship in some ways are parallel, but not exactly the same thing. Um, if, if When I graduated from Georgia Tech with my degree in aerospace engineering, um, I would, people used to say I had an engineering mind and a liberal arts personality, and at the time I thought I might need to be medicated for that condition. But what I quickly realized is that I was very creative and I liked building things. I liked creating things. And so a lot of times people think, well, I know I want to be an entrepreneur someday, so I'll just go work for one or I'll just go start my own company. And thank God I did not do that because that's not how I learn. I'm, I, I have to be taught things. I have to sort of digest them before I'm ready to take that leap and be an entrepreneur. So, my, my path was not direct. I didn't just go out and sort of eat macaroni and cheese for a couple of years and start a company. Um, I worked for some other companies. I learned along the way. But I think what I started to realize is that innovation is driven not just by what you know, but by what you notice. And I, I knew a lot. Um, you know, I got good grades and I learned things very quickly. But I needed to learn to notice things. And because all innovation comes from what you notice, not from what you know. So as I went along and, and was involved with a number of startups, was involved with large companies, same thing, I've been in more of a corporate environment, large consulting firm, um, went to business school, then got involved in some smaller startups, and I started to just kind of notice things. Um, so at first, I helped other people start companies. I really didn't have, I don't know if it was the guts or, or, or the confidence to just go out and do it myself. Um, and then I became a mom. And that's what made me become an entrepreneur. I became a mom, um, which was my greatest 
adventure and venture today. I have a five-year-old son. Um, but if you knew me, most of my friends that knew me, the idea of me becoming a mother was, was rather curious because um, I was <coughs> one traveling the world. I started a footwear company with Shaquille O'Neal and Mike Piazza and was doing, uh, I was rarely in Atlanta. I had places that I lived in other cities and believe me, my mother-in-law was wondering if grandchildren would ever come along because I was gallivanting around the world doing businesses. Um, but when I became a mom for the first time, I wanted flexibility in my life. And so I decided that I was going to step back and start my own company. And I wasn't sure what it was going to be. I was doing consulting with a, a woman who's my business partner in Nourish. We were doing consulting. Actually, we were doing large infrastructure consulting. Um, I teach real estate finance here at Georgia Tech in the management school. I had run a large real estate in, uh, investment and development company. So we started doing projects like landfills and water reservoirs and forks and um, my business partner was the deputy attorney for the state of Atlanta. She's now um, the minority leader for the state legislature. So we were doing these large infrastructure projects and I literally showed up at a meeting one day complaining about the fact that here I had the baby and I had the diaper bag and I had all these bottles that I cleaned the night before and I had the formula and I had the water and when when babies are hungry, they don't give you like a 15 minute warning to start the assembly process. It's just loud and it's immediate. And so I started mixing this together and I'm sure that I was you know, very frustrated. And I went home that night, my husband works for Coke and I said, someone has got to make a baby water. This is absolutely ridiculous. I am not my mother, I am not home boiling water. And after about, so I demanded to meet the head of Dasani. And uh, I gave him about two weeks and he didn't produce the meeting that I had asked for. And so <laughs> it was like, our coke does not work that way. Um, one thing you will find about entrepreneurs is we are not patient. Patience is not a virtue that we were given. Um, and so I said, well, then I'm just going to do it myself. So uh, we started Nourish, and Nourish is a patented product that we developed. Uh, I'm going to show it to you. But uh, we have two products. One is a spill proof bottled water for kids. Not rocket science, guys, but you know, just in case. And this one is a ready to serve baby bottle. So it's pre measured, purified water with the markings on it, clean, ready to go. So when you're traveling with kids, you don't have to give them sugary drinks, etc. cetera. Um, so the interesting thing, you know, Mitch, I'm listening to you talk about social entrepreneurship. And it occurs to me that we're all social. We're people, right? We're social. Most of us have things that we're pretty passionate about. It could be children, it could be health, it could be the environment. It could be literacy, et cetera. And a lot of us have entrepreneurial skills. We like to take risks. We like to try new things. I think the greatest lesson in life is when you find a way to combine them. I, I've always had social passions that I donated money to, et cetera. And I've always had businesses on the side. And the fact that Nourish became sort of a social-oriented business is not because I really, really thought about it ahead of time. It was actually because of my customers. So we launched Nourish really was designed to be a bit of a convenience product and a health product because I wanted moms <coughs> and kids to have access to clean water and clean bottles at all times. For me that meant all times meant when you're going to the airport and you miss a flight connection or you're out at the playground or you're at the zoo. That was, that was my definition of having access to clean water at all times. Until about a year ago, when um, and we had when we started Nourish, we said we're going to give back. We're going to do well and do good at the same time. We're not going to wait till we're profitable and then give back. We're going to do it day one. So we donated a little bit of water to children's shelters in Atlanta. You know, something we thought was manageable. And then about a year ago, Haiti was hit by an earthquake, and I got a call from a customer here in Atlanta, actually. And she said, I want to order water, but I want to send it to Haiti. And I said, OK. I absolutely know how to sell, sell you water, and I have no clue how to get it to Haiti, because FedEx and UPS did not get there today. But give me a week. And so we started our process calling here, reaching out to the Red Cross, FEMA, et cetera. Um, everything kept hitting brick walls. And then we finally found a little um, not-for-profit here in Atlanta that had a network of private <coughs> aircraft and doctors that were going down to Haiti to help children. And we showed them the product and they decided to take it down for us. And so that started a process where between us, our customers, our suppliers, we've donated thousands and thousands of bottles to children in Haiti. Um, thankfully, my customers thought bigger than I did. I mean, we were doing some local things that we could manage. 
but it was that challenge from our customers to step up, and usually I'm the one thinking big. Very few people tell me I'm not thinking big enough, but they really challenged us to, to step it up, and, and we did, and, and the business had to catch up with that. Um, as a result, our, our latest um, interesting challenge has been um, we started the last couple of weeks getting a lot of orders from some people out in California that are sending it over to Japan because the water quality in Japan is is very, very challenged right now. And I'll tell you, I mean, you live, you live there. I live there. Um, in fact, I lived in Fukushima Prefecture uh, in a program I did through Georgia Tech. I studied and lived in Japan. Um, twice, the year before I graduated, the year after I graduated. Uh, so I lived very close to, to where the tragedies occurred, and so that's near and dear to my heart. But, um, you know, I think, I think the key is to notice things. I just noticed something that was bothering me during the day, and it was the convenience and cleanliness of having access to clean water. I noticed when my customers made suggestions and we responded to it. So part of it is sort of getting out of your own way and being the expert and listening to the people around you and then taking advantage of, of a way that you can help. I think also it's really interesting, Laura, maybe just in 30 seconds, you can actually talk a little bit about the real invention of it, which is the patent, which is basically the lid to it. It's not spill uh, yeah, capability. You can't, you can't spill this. I mean, I've challenged, you know, believe me, every five-year-old has tried to break it, but when you bite, the water comes out. And when you let go, it closes, so it doesn't involve motor skills. Um, which has been interesting because, again, it was developed for children, but now we find seniors are using it, um, adults use it. Uh, we have celebrities that use it because it doesn't mess up their lipstick and they can't spill it. Um, you never know. You never know. You, just, <laughs> you learn something new every day, and that's the key is you have to be open to learning something new every day. That's actually what makes entrepreneurship so rewarding. And I think Laura brings up a really interesting point, and that's the fact that many times as entrepreneurs, we kind of see a need and we start to fill it, but eventually, um, most times I've experienced, the market actually tells you what it wants. And so many times that opportunity is actually bigger. Uh, when I was introduced, uh, they talked briefly about the fact that I invented the orange and yellow tennis ball, which is still sold today. It's 30 years ago. And I had a very specific reason for inventing the ball, but I can tell you that uh, it did much better in the pet market than it did in the tennis industry. <laughs> so, you know, you really never know that. But um, as I also alluded to, uh, Scott Schickler I've known for decades, and um, Scott is uh, one of the foremost uh, experts, uh, not only in the country, but really in the world, on uh, youth empowerment. And he has dedicated his life towards uh, empowering every student, and he is doing that, uh, as I mentioned, through a company that he founded called Accent. Uh, you can learn all about them at Accent.com, but uh, Scott has used it as a vehicle, as, a, as I said, to uh, create not only the Ultimate Life Institute, but more importantly, his Magic Wand Foundation, uh, which I'm also a co-founder of. And uh, Scott, I thought uh, it would be great for you to talk a little bit about, from where you see things, you know, what really is an entrepreneur? and uh, how you eventually recognize this calling. And uh, he today is embodying um, the life of a social entrepreneur. Uh, David and I were speaking beforehand, and 24 years ago, a bunch of uh, people got together who were entrepreneurs and said, we, you know, we need to really build businesses that are gonna do something, and they started the Social Venture Network, and uh, they have a conference, uh, two of them a year. Uh, David is a member, and I went as a guest. And I just flew in from their spring conference in Portland last night. And I have to tell you, the things that people are doing there, as you know, is really special. And uh, I put this Scott in there, it's some, some really incredible stuff. So Scott, maybe talk a little bit about what is an entrepreneur, and a little bit about your journey that got you to do the things that you're doing. Because it's always interesting that the challenge between um, having those capitalistic, uh, we'll call it instincts, to make money, and then eventually recognizing um, I can make money, maybe even more than I ever thought by doing good. Okay, Mitch, thank you. Uh, I don't know how many of you um, remember a time, maybe around third or fourth grade, at least when I was a kid in school, uh, I remember an activity where the teacher would ask us to go to a box, and inside the box were literally cards that listed different careers. And the, the activity was to go through this box and look through different careers, and see if anything appealed to you. And the only reason I remember that is um, uh, 
years later, when I went back to look at one of these boxes from my elementary days, I, it, it was bizarre, but there wasn't a card that said entrepreneur. There wasn't a card that said business owner. I was maybe a lazy kid because I stopped at the A's and I figured I'll either be uh, uh, an archaeologist or an accountant or something. Uh, but uh, I, I became an entrepreneur, I think, out of necessity, probably around um, somewhere between age 10 and 12, when I wanted money for something. And my mother said, you know, I'm not a bank. If you want money, you have to earn it. And uh, to, a, you know, to a young kid growing up in New York, the way that we earned money uh, was when it snowed, we got a shovel and shovel a driveway. And when the leaves fell, um, we'd rake them up. And you know, as the seasons changed, so did the businesses. And it was really an innovative way to make some money. Uh, that stayed with me throughout my teen years. And, in college, I was actually um, faced with another challenge. I needed money to pay for school. I was accepted into Fordham University and given some scholarship money, but I needed to come up with the balance of the tuition. And so, uh, uh, out of necessity, I ended up creating a business that grew to employ about 60 people and paid for four years of college. Uh, it it uh, was uh, pretty successful. I got a lot of uh, uh, media attention. And then one thing led to the next, I'm giving talks on entrepreneurship and um, getting uh, speaking fees and I, just one thing after the next, I'm running business after business. business. And for the most part, based on some need I had to fulfill. I, I had a lack of resources or I saw uh, an opportunity in the marketplace and it was very rewarding to try and come up with a solution. Uh, I, I ended up... Um, writing books on entrepreneurship. I ended up teaching entrepreneurship to kids. Uh, I discovered that if I taught entrepreneurship to inner city kids in, in the South Bronx in New York, that I was giving them an alternative, uh, a legitimate way to making money. And I'll never forget this one kid who told me uh, after I helped him start his own business that he felt good at night going home and being able to tell his mom where he made his money. And he also noted that he didn't have to worry about being shot while trying to close the deal. So these were some of the pros of running a legitimate business. Uh, well, this business took, uh, took on a life of its own. and um, I had this financial goal to become a millionaire by the time I was 30. And uh, I got a phone call one day from a Atlanta business group, and they wanted to buy my company. And the price was a million and a half dollars, and I jumped at it. And, and, uh, my wife and I moved to Atlanta. And, and, and I, I want to tell you about 10 years ago, my life took a, a really interesting turn. Um, we had one child. We were living in Atlanta. My wife was pregnant with, uh, with our second child. And um, she went into labor in the house in Alpharetta. And um, it was really fast. Our first child, it took, it took like all day. But for some reason, the second child, you know, at around 7, seven o'clock at night, she said, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm having the baby. And I said, okay, let me get some stuff together. She says, no, I think it's, it's happening right now. I said, well, let me, let me make a phone call and get some help here. And I called some, uh, some friends uh, who were, uh, I don't know what you call them, you know, uh, midwife. midwife. Midwives, thank you. And they said, all right, we're going to give you some advice here as they could hear my wife uh, screaming in the background. And they said, we're coming over, we're about 30 minutes away, but here's the advice. Number one, tell your wife to stop pushing. So at this point, she was on the ground, holding my ankle and squeezing, and I said, honey, don't push. <laughs> and she looked at me, squeezing some more. And then the second thing they said was, um, uh, if the baby comes, make sure you keep the baby in a nice clean blanket or towel. And I said, okay, and they said they're on their way. And I hung up, and, and that's when I realized that they had left out a lot of information <laughs> between don't push and if the baby comes. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> so uh, my wife, as she has my ankle, um, I, I have to ask her if we have any clean towels in the house. And she said, yeah, around the corner, but you're not going anywhere. And I said, well, uh, I've got to. And at this point, the contractions were about 20 seconds apart. Uh, and I said, I promise you, if you let me go, I will be back before the next one. 
looks at me, and she screams, and she says, you got it. And she lets me go, and I go dashing across the house. I grab some blankets and towels. I come back. And, um, at at, at 7.47, um, in, the, in, the, in the wintry uh, darkness, um, my son comes out. And as he comes out, he's got the umbilical cord around his neck. And uh, time stood still for me because uh, I certainly wasn't equipped to deal with this. But it also hit me, you know, like one of those movies where all these things start flashing through your mind. Uh, it didn't matter how much money I had in the bank or that I had a 5,000 square foot house with three car garage, even though we only had one car. <laughs> None of those things matter in that moment. Um, all that mattered was that this innocent life was literally suffocating. And my life changed in that moment for the better. As I reached over and I grabbed the umbilical cord and just sort of nudged it a little bit, it loosened enough that I could then lift it over my son's head. And he instantly came out and I caught him. This day, he's, he's fine, and my wife is fine. And just as I was leaning back, Laura, with my wife on one arm and my new son on, on the other, wondering what I'm supposed to do with this cord that never shows up in any team. <laughs> Whenever a kid is born, there's no umbilical cord. They come out, they clean the whistle, and just as I'm wondering what I'm supposed to do in all these big lives, and they look around and they, they take my son, but. Uh, they took care of my wife. And, and, and what changed for me in that moment was um, the realization that I, you know, I don't know what my son's going to grow up and be, what his contribution to the world is going to be, but I know it's going to be something. And I started to reflect on my own life, and, and I realized from that day forward that what I was going to do with my life couldn't just be about money, and frankly, not even about one of my greatest passions, which is solving problems. My wife calls me Solution Scott. All right? It's not even about that. It had to have much more meaning. There had to be a, a deep connection to something I was passionate about. 90 days later, um, I sold the business I was in, and I launched the company. Uh, uh, at the time, I like to think big. And, uh, the day we launched the company, we called it Global Education Technologies. Um, we had zero dollars in sales, but I, I knew it had to be global. Um, that company's name has changed over the years to Accent. And we make uh, software for kids uh, with special needs. We serve uh, about three million kids uh, in 20 some odd states. Uh, we're all over the world, wherever there's a military base, if there's a family with a child with special needs, our company provides the software to assist them. We're, uh, we're a smaller company, uh, we, we're probably around a $10 million company. Uh, the first seven years of that business, I felt great. I felt like every single thing we were doing had meaning and purpose. Um, I, I was making money, I had a great, uh, a great living, but it, it, but it meant something. Then I learned a, a, another incredible lesson. As we were expanding, and frankly, I was getting a little bored. The business was growing about 10% a year, or so it wasn't anything uh, uh, major. But there wasn't much for me to do. I, I, I'm not a software person. Um, uh, you know, we had a software company. I was sort of an entrepreneur, and I was getting a little bored. And I started to uh, think of, you know, some real silly things. Like as a as a father, when when about what you want for your kids, right? You know, it, it pretty much comes down to just a couple of things. You want them to grow up to be happy and successful. You probably want that for yourselves. Uh, every teacher wants that. And I started wondering, how is it that everyone wants that? Schools are designed to prepare students to live happy and successful lives by their own definition of success. Yet there are so many problems. You know, there's 20 million students in public school today that are not expected to graduate. They'll either drop out or fail out. 20 million students. It's about half the students, right, Scott? It's, uh, it, it's, it's a little more than a third, but it's, it's a ridiculous uh, percentage. 
Uh, one out of three girls has an unwanted teen pregnancy before they're 19 years old. Last year, last year, more young people filed bankruptcy than graduated college. You know, now maybe you might think these are these are juvenile issues. These are issues that, that the, the young have to deal with. But according to a recent Gallup study, 80% of adults are not passionate about what they do for a living. So you don't grow out of these things. So as, as the entrepreneur and he starts to wonder, and someone who really cares about kids and, and trying to empower them to, to live their dreams, I started wondering, well, how is this possible? This common denominator that we all want for ourselves, yet the reality of what's going on in the world. And uh, when an entrepreneur wonders, and maybe when he has access to some capital and control of a company, this is sort of what happens. Uh, we, we launched a special division in our company. We call it the Ultimate Life Institute. Because it seemed like the advice that we're all given on how to live a happy and successful life was backfiring. So rather than come up with um, you know, more advice to live a great life, we had to redefine it and call it the ultimate life. A life where you're pursuing your passion, you're making a difference in the world, there's meaning in everything you're doing. We created this Ultimate Life Institute. And over the last three years, uh, we've invested over $3 million researching what really makes people happy and what really leads to success. Not the success I'm talking about with these awful stats, but real success. And the way to do that was to study the happiest, most successful people to have ever walked the planet. We've done that, and we've also studied the studies. And what we came up with was uh, just startling. We found a commonality. And the commonality had nothing to do with gender, nothing to do with geography, uh, income, how far they got in school. It has to do with their mindsets, how they think. And even more interestingly, we found seven particular mindsets that what we call the ultra-successful have, and their mindsets are the exact opposite mindsets of what we typically teach to our children and students inadvertently. The exact opposite. It's almost like a bad Disney movie. If the movie opened and with, you know, here's the book on how to be happy and successful, and there was a page missing, and all these kids had a scavenge of the world looking for that missing page, and they're following the advice on how to live a happy, successful life, and they finally find that missing page, you know, in the jungle or underwater somewhere, and it says, by the way, uh, do the exact opposite, you know. That's sort of what, uh, what happened. And so in 2008, we said, you know, we have to take this research and we have to do something about it. We have to bring it to, uh, to kids and schools. And we started to do that. And, and we're doing it as a for-profit company because I believe that being a social entrepreneur uh, keeps, keeps the integrity of the business. You have to make payroll. You have to make sure that what you're selling provides value. And as a for-profit business, the marketplace will tell you. But I also know that there is a place for those who need this information and who don't have the money uh, to buy it. And we created the Magic Wand Foundation in 2008 to provide this to kids all over the world. So whether uh, you're a student or someone who works with kids, a parent or an educator, we're now providing the mindsets uh, to help really empower kids to identify their passion and live their dreams and make a difference. That's great. You guys enjoying yourself? Yeah. Really fascinating stories. Go to magicwandfoundation.org. Um, again, www.magicwandfoundation.org. You will learn all about uh, these uh, seven mindsets and some of the things that uh, they're doing. And um, most importantly, they really are uh, helping a lot of kids, especially Scott, your ultimate life summit. David, when we started to talk a little bit earlier, I mentioned this whole concept of, you know, we'll call it the, the triple play, you know, the triple, you know, stage of, of, of these models, of these social venture models, and I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about what exactly that is and how you guys got into that. And more importantly, um, there is a movement going on, and, and, and David is actually at the, at the forefront of it, and that is actually the creation of a new type of corporation. 
Um, if you ever do go into business, and hopefully some of you will, you will see traditionally the C Corps and S Corps and LLCs and so on and so forth, but there's now a new B Corp. And um, David's uh, company is actually one of them. I actually got to meet uh, some of the key people that are behind that. So maybe talk a little bit about this triple digit um, concept as it relates to social entrepreneurship and this B Corporation and the movement towards it. I thought it was fascinating. Well, yeah, so the triple bottom line, which, uh, which a lot of people talk about, you know, it, people plan a profit, you know, social impact, environmental impact, and of course your financial impact um, that you make. Um, I think it, it ties to what the B Corporation is all about. Where we're, I think what we're witnessing is kind of this move from what I, I call, and I know the B Corp folks would put it this way too, from what I'll call shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. So it's this notion that, you know, you have pretty much any company in the U.S. today, you know, um, prior to the health, certainly publicly held, you have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize the return for shareholders, so, you know, end of story. And especially if you're incorporated in states like Delaware, which, which is why a lot of people go to Delaware, you know, a lot of case law supports that. So you can see about shareholder lawsuits where, you know, if, if a company, any of our companies, for example, especially if we're publicly held, wanted to um, do something for the environment, wanted to do something for social impact. Um, shareholders can question that. You argue, are, are you putting too much of your resource there and not enough in my pocket and you take it to court and especially say like Delaware can win. So there's a movement really that's out there called the B Corp community, you know, the B Corp movement, and it kind of works in a couple of different ways. So um, recognizing that corporate law is really a state law, so there's no federal corporate law per se, so they can assert the mind for themselves. So, um, for example, Federal Books is we're a C corporation in the state of Georgia um, for legal and tax purposes, but we back in 2007 as a founding member of the B Corp community decided to become what we call B certified. So think of the B Corp movement today for the most part a lot about standards, it's a lot about sort of that independent third party, you know, arm's length, um, certification process that you can go to basically begin to distinguish yourselves in a marketplace today that's very crowded and very overworked, I think, in terms of, you know, who's more green than the next, who's more socially impactful than the next, and how do you know? You know, frankly, the, the large companies with the large marketing budgets and are very good at what I call just you know, the, the cost marketing, um, they can make you think that, you know, the aerosol they're producing or the fabrics they're producing, whatever it is that they make, um, are really the greatest thing on the planet. And of course, they have the dollars to, to get you to think that way, when in fact, maybe it's not particularly true if you kind of um, dive a little deeper. So, so the B Corp movement was basically saying, we can hold ourselves to a standard and, and, and essentially agree to um, essentially do a, a, a pretty in-depth um, survey that you go through that they've now modified it during version like 3.0. We were one of the founding members in 07 on 1.0. But, you know, it basically walks you through a series of questions that you have to answer, and then you have to get a minimum score. You have to have a minimum score to be in the B Corp community, and then you open yourself up to audit. So B Lab, which is the five months of the nonprofit that sort of governs all of this, then comes out every year or every other year to make sure they're auditing whatever you said in there with regards to environmental practices, employee practices, um, how you deem yourself to be a good corporate citizen in the communities in which you operate, et cetera, et cetera. They'll actually come in and say, all right, you said you did X, Y, and Z on recycling shows, you know, and so forth. So, um, and those scores, by the way, are, are public within the B Corp community online. So you can basically um, really kind of transparent, you know, from with large to with in terms of kind of really looking and seeing who's doing what. Now, B-Lab B really didn't stop there, so they have kind of three arms to what they do. First is the certification process. Say there's over 400 corporations that have been elected to come into the B Corp community to, to essentially fill out the surveys, be audited, and claim that they're more green or more socially impactful and so forth that you can judge for yourself. Um, a lot of consumer-facing brands in that group as well. Second is there is a political process where they're actually going around state house to state house and actually trying to get state legislatures to adopt uh, the B Corporation as a legitimate form of incorporation. So, for example, Maryland passed it, Vermont's passed it, I think New York and New Jersey have passed it. There's, I think, four states. And four more of the working. Four more on the working. I think they're going to have nine by the end of this year, and they think within three to five years they could have 30, 40 states, where basically you can go in on day one and say, I want to be B Corp. B stands for public, capital B stands for public benefit. And the idea over time is could you actually link public policy to, to the B Corp status? status. So, you elect to become a B Corp, which means you're environmentally responsible, socially impact responsible, and 
employees while you do all the kind of things that frankly we would all say you should do anyway, right? But it's kind of getting you know that outside independent audit feature to it to say that it really is happening. And then at the same time, uh, maybe the only public policy things like you know, tax breaks or incentive you know, training or um, whatever to to sort of motivate people to become more and more in the equal community. And then third is there is this um, really they're doing a tremendous amount of work in figuring out how to get capital, especially large chunks of institutional capital on Wall Street, to essentially track into and support the Negro community. So, you know, all of us have struggled with how we raise capital and, and so forth, but when you want to actually go raise capital as a social venture, as a Corp, non Corp, and it's interesting in terms of how you have to do that. So the certain triple bottom line means you're not necessarily going to maximize shareholder wealth. Um, that you're trying to balance the, the interest of multiple stakeholders. And as you do that, it takes a certain a special kind, actually, of investor to want to get behind that. Um, especially if you're looking for you know, it's traditional types of money, whether it's you know, angel round funding, you know, series A, series B, all the way through the capital cycle to get to where maybe you want to do an IPO. So a lot can happen now in the, in the institutional money world. There's estimated to be $120 billion of what we call impact capital waiting on the sidelines to figure out a way to come into the space. But again, there's no standards, there's no S&P, there's no Bloomberg, there's no Moody's, there's no rating system. So that if we all had three companies and you were trying to figure out, we all said we're all green, we're all socially responsible, but you know, you're a trader on a desk and you want to move you know, $10 million to $20 million in a heartbeat, you don't have time to figure that out and do your due diligence. So again, it's all about rating systems and the B-Lab community, along with the Rockefeller Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, all the big names are really now well down the path to coming up with these rating systems, which I think is really exciting for the space we think long term. Three years down, five years down, certainly ten years now, I think we're going to see a much, much more vibrant um, social impact economy that's, that's going to have real dollars in Wall Street tracking into it and funding companies, and I um, think it's very exciting. So, so um, I know you have an annual report there, but it's, it's a group now, like I said, 400 companies, but civilian and collective revenue. We were a founding member. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, a great, it's a great operation to go through because, again, um, when you're a for-profit social enterprise, I think one of the things that is we've wrestled with, and I don't know to, to what extent you guys have, people sometimes look at you and go, wait a minute, let me get this right. For-profit social enterprise, like, well, how, can that even exist in the same sentence? I mean, is that sort of, you know, um, uh, how, how could it really work? And so people question that, and they think sometimes there are these things that take them to, well, must be a scam. You're really doing this, like in our case, with the books, you collect books, but you sell them, and are you really, you know, what are you really doing with the money and all that? So again, great to have these outside, whether it's B Corp or others that may emerge, it's great to have these outside agencies who want to essentially certify that you are truly a triple bottom line company, or a double bottom line company, that you truly have social impact, truly environmental impact, and sort of rate you against your peers. Um, you as consumers, especially with consumer-facing brands, it's great that you can go and check out. One of the things also, being at the Social Venture Network, and as I said, go to svn.org, there's really some great information there, um, you know, was I actually met groups of people, that are investors that are specializing in looking for these types of companies to invest in, which uh, was really exciting because they get it, and you don't have to sell them on any of this, so um, shall be continued. Well, we're going to start the wrapping up here, but before we go to questions um, from all of you, uh, one thing I know about the, our guests, um, including obviously uh, Laura and uh, Scott, is, and they've mentioned that they're both uh, big dreamers. And um, I, I like to say for all of them, um, the game has just begun. It's going to be interesting to watch all of your journeys. So, Scott, maybe we'll start off with you and talk and share a little bit with the group here some of your goals and aspirations and big dreams, especially to empower our youth. Sure. Uh, I've been fortunate that I've been able to reorganize my life so that every day when I go to work, uh, I am completely on mission with our for-profit and our non-profit organization. And um, we have, we're a small company, about 45 people or so, and growing about 30% a year. We have one major focus, and we are trying to figure out how to uh, effectively and uh, inexpensively empower kids all over the world. And when I say empower them, I, I, um, here's, uh, you know, 
you've, you've probably heard the term social, being socially responsible. And the, um, uh, just this morning, I actually started to take issue with that expression because it, it implies that there's an obligation. And I think a lot of young people grow up, um, whether they learn this at church through a concept of tithing, or they just learn to be good social citizens through parents, uh, through good parenting. Um, th there's a difference between being socially responsible and connecting your deepest passions, what really drives you, to causes that you also feel passionate about. There's a difference between uh, being socially responsible and going on a social uh, adventure where what you're doing, the type of business you're starting, the type of company you go to work for, things that you innovate are both tapping into what you're good at, what you believe in, what, mi what matters to you, and what will make a difference, what transcends you and makes a difference for others. And in that sweet spot, uh, we are, our, our big dream is to, is to continue to find ways, almost as if it's an empowerment drug, and, and we can just kind of inject it into kids so that they can quickly and easily learn to identify what matters most to them and then go out there and make a difference. And so we, we've created an Ultimate Life uh, Summit. We bring over 100 students a year. Um, from uh, uh, 10 plus countries, teenagers, and we teach them these concepts. We have developed a, an online website called myultimatelife.com where we're learning how to empower kids online, and we're creating programs uh, that, that sustain this. So the, the really big dream is how do we reach a kid uh, that's in Detroit, and how do we reach a kid who is in uh, London, and how do we reach a kid who is in the Dominican Republic easily and, and uh, in, a, in a scalable way, both from a for-profit and a non-profit. And you're on your way. And, um, and the happiness is actually part of the journey. You know, that, that's what's great. When you, when you identify your passion first and you're, and you're living your passion every day, that's where you find the real joy and happiness. You learn that it's on the inside out. And, and, and I really think, Mitch, that the solution to the the uh, challenges that I mentioned earlier uh, lie in, a, in an often overlooked place in the hearts and minds of young people. And I think um, the work that we're doing, I feel like we have an opportunity to make a generational shift. To learn more about Scott, as I mentioned, go to www.excent.com and go to www.magicwandfoundation.com. Uh, you'll get a good sense. You'll learn all about some of the mindsets, like everything is possible. Uh, we talk about passion first, being 100% accountable. Uh, we are connected, attitude of gratitude, and uh, much more, including how the time is now. So these are mindsets that really matter and can really help uh, help kids. Well, Laura, you're a, little, you're a little bit earlier in the journey, but I know you have some big, big dreams, and uh, I'd like to think the school helped uh, influence some of that as well. Well, I'll tell you, I'm going I'm to give you two sets of goals. One is the Nourish goals, and then the other is my personal goals. Um, Nourish has a very clear goal. We want to become the brand that stands for health and nutrition for children, and that may mean children of all ages. But in my mind, every child should have access to clean water at all times, and water is more important than just basic hydration. It turns out that almost 30% of the calories that you ingest in a day come from what you drink, not from what you eat. So next time you sit down and you know have a salad and then drink a Coke, um, which you see a lot of people do all the time, you realize where all the sugar comes from. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with <coughs> groups that focus on childhood diabetes, childhood obesity. Um, if we could get every child to go back to drinking water, which always used to be the habit before sugary drinks and now drinks that are colors not found in nature that say zero calorie, but that just means they chemically altered the sweetener. Um, unfortunately, that's what our kids are growing up on. And if we think that our population isn't healthy today, we haven't even started to see what's going to happen in the future. I want to change that. I want every child drinking water, and I want to build a healthy lifestyle again. That's the nourish goal. Um, my personal goal. As, as I've become involved with not just Nourish, but other companies that I've helped start, 
what I've been very lucky to do is be in a position to help other people find their opportunity as well. And people always say, you know, what made you, what made you come up with that idea? Or what made you go for it, et cetera? And I always say that your best ideas happen when you lack resources. So if somebody comes up to me and says, I can't do what you asked, I don't have enough, fill in the blank, time, I don't have enough budget, I don't have enough people, or most of my students here that say they don't have enough time to get their project done, um, my answer is always great. Go come up with a solution, then we'll talk about the resources. Because if you have unlimited resources, that's easy. That's not even a challenge. If I gave you an unlimited budget, you don't have to innovate. That's easy. If I gave you unlimited time, you won't do anything to the last six hours anyway, right? So your best answers happen when you lack resources, when you lack time, when you lack money. So all the people that sit around and say, I've got an idea, but I can't do it today, I don't have money, not a reason. Not a reason at all. Everyone in this room could be changing the world today. You don't need to wait till you have a resume, a degree, etc. You can do it all now. And so my personal goal is to continue to help more people step out, take a risk, give it a try. Um, I'll tell you something not a lot of people know about me. When I was in third grade and had that box, um, I don't think the card was in there either. But I always said I wanted to be president of the United States. And you will not hear a lot of women say that. Um, and I still say that, that I want to be president of the United States someday. I don't want a career in politics. I don't want to be a politician by training. I do at some point want to give back to the community. And, and in some ways, I'm doing it today, being on the Greta board, being on the school boards, et cetera. But I want to do that not because of the title. I couldn't care what it's called. But I want to do that because of a woman that I met when I was up at Harvard in Business School named Laura Lissler. She wrote a book called Women World Leaders. And her book is interesting because she decided she wanted to compare a woman's leadership style with, through change uh, with a man. So not leadership in general, but specifically through change. And she went out to do her study and found that there actually weren't enough women leading companies through change to do a meaningful study. There weren't enough women politicians leading through change. What she did find, and this was back in the late 80s, early 90s, was that there were 18 current or former women heads of state, meaning they had been elected prime minister or president of their country. And it took her two years, but she set out to interview all of these women. And as she interviewed them all, and it ranged from Margaret Thatcher to Benazir Bhutto to Tansu Chiller, she, she realized something pretty amazing. None of these women had met each other. Isn't that amazing? same job as only 18 other people on the planet and we've never met each other despite the UN and all these other things. And so she did something pretty amazing. She decided to bring them all to Boston for a three-day session and she grabbed a couple of us students to host them. So I got to spend three days with these women and what she talked about that sits with me today is the power of the mirror. And she said the way she described the power of the mirror is she said, you know, in my country, Little boys will come up to me and ask if they can be president. I thought that was kind of a stupid question. Of course a boy can be president. All I do is turn on the television, see the president of the United States talk. And she said, ah, but that's not real in Iceland. Because the power of the mirror is exponentially more powerful the closer it is to you. So while your children may think that their hero is the guy that can slam dunk on TV, he's really not. The real hero is the guy next door that's influencing him. And so the power of the mirror is more important the closer that it gets. So while I have very lofty goals for my company, for my friends, my personal goal is that every single person who contacts me that says, can you help me? I have an idea. I want to get it launched. How do I do this, et cetera? Um, I will always pick up the phone and help. And hopefully my company is just one of many that I have on my company start. Great. Well, David, one billion people in the world are illiterate, as we know. Two-thirds of them are women, right? Statistics staggering. So tell me a little bit about some of the big dreams for you and uh, Better World Books. Well, I think for Better World Books, it's, yeah, I mean, that's it. Um, you know, literacy, I mean, I think outside of, you know, clean water and, and really the ability for, for, especially children, to be well-nourished, um, I think, you know, you can look at literacy really as we do, which is we can sort of view it as the bedrock of any kind of social change. In fact, you could almost say it really good parts of the in having democracy. Um, how can you have a true democracy if people aren't learning and can't understand what they want to 
want to be part of, let alone what they want to change. So, um, at so many levels, whether you're talking about environmental degradation, um, crime, race, uh, um, access to clean drinking water, uh, you know, incarceration rates, whatever, you know, literacy is absolutely uh, is key. In fact, in this country, I know I read recently that the state of Oklahoma, I believe, has gotten this down to a science where for them to predict, for them to actually build the number of prison beds they think they need today, they go in and actually look at something like it's either third or fourth grade literacy rates. Um, and that's, a, that's just, you know, scientifically proven out to be this, the best predictor for what they'll need in the future. Um, you know, prison budget, which is pretty, pretty scary, I think, and pretty sad in this country. About 40 million of you know, functional literate adults here in the United States, let alone what we talk about in the developing world. So, yeah, federal books mission is very, very on point with regard to what we can do to move the needle. We, when we do this, we do it in terms of money and books to get behind NGOs and nonprofits who have um, proven that they have great impact in, in all parts of the world in which they work. Um, they're very um, different models, so we work with groups anywhere from Books for Africa, which is the largest donor of books to Sub-Saharan Africa, to the National Center for Family Literacy, working here with 6,000 communities here in the United States, and all of them different, um, all of them sort of you know, tweaking different models and you know, so they're showing a lot of success in the environments that they're in. So, from the company's perspective, I think, yes, very much around literacy and education. I would say that on top of that, we, we feel, and it's, sort of indicative of what we're is happening in this space of for profit social enterprise is that more and more people that get intrigued about this look around for examples. We've got you know a couple of great examples up here to, to learn from. Um, we find that there's very, very few of us, very few of us that have um, been around much, have had much success, have scaled, have taken outside money, and we can anyone look at it. So what's really encouraging to me is on the education front to see what's happening in undergraduate programs. And graduate programs, especially in graduate schools of business that I'm seeing now, you know, of course, we found social entrepreneurship. Um, we've had federal books that had the good fortune to have um, arguably three of the top ten business schools in the country are Harvard, their alma mater, Harvard, uh, Dartmouth, and uh, Kellogg School at Northwestern, um, have now written actual case studies on federal books. Now, that's, been, you know, that's not a pat on the back for us. It's simply there are not that many of us that have scaled to a size where you can kind of write an interesting so, so to be in the classroom, as I've been having a good fortune to do over the past six months, as they launch those case studies um, and sit there in the back row and watch them being taught and sort of see all the light bulbs go on with the students, um, that's very, very, very encouraging, obviously, to be in a setting like this. So, so I think there's an educational component of what we're all doing as examples of what can happen. Well, like good. So, um, and then I think you know, personal. It's very much about. I feel like I've been very fortunate to be in this position to grow this operation, to scale it, and to again, much like Laura said, really be accessible to to many people, young people, older people who are who are trying to figure out the next move in their career. I find I, I find that I'm just constantly getting phone calls and input from folks who are trying to figure out. You know, I, I've always wanted to kind of do this. What do you think? And so there's a tremendous amount of, if nothing else, of just sharing and. Not that none of us has really the, the magic answer, um, but that we have some insights and some experiences that we can share to kind of keep this, keep this all going. And that's really what you think about the power of capitalism. We we're in a 14 trillion dollar economy, and you know something like close to 80 percent of that is, is private as wealth. You know, it's the private wealth that's being generated through through the private sector, if you will. Um, it's, you know, it's not. We're, I mean, think about the next 10 years if you're in um, nonprofit world or even in government. They're shrinking. You know, um, you can, you know, no matter what side of the political fence you're on, it would be, it'd be unrealistic to think that the size of government is going to, you know, continue to grow exponentially. If anything, it's more folks of how do we shrink it, how we cut it back services. Um, and then same thing in the NGO world. I mean, everybody's got a budget crisis. Everybody's trying to face how they're going to grow, how they're going to meet this need. So if we can unleash even a tiny bit of the power of the private sector to get behind social and environmental change in a for-profit model. I mean that's to me that's where it is and that's where that's where I think so much of the good that we all hope is going to we're going to see in the next five years is going to come from that. So it's from you out there, it's from us up here, it's from a lot of people I think down and then yeah, it was this whole conference at in Oxford two weeks ago and, you know seeing um, seeing what's happening across the world, meeting social entrepreneurs from you know South America, Asia, Africa. I mean it's incredible. It's just the energy and Intelligence and creativity and the innovation is out there across the planet, and it's uh, it's really exciting. To be
exciting movement, it's an exciting time as I started off. And remember, I talked about the purpose-driven economy. And I think we're at a real precipice here. I think um, we're going to see a lot more of this. And um, hopefully we have uh, maybe ignited some uh, sparks within you and that you're going to go out there and one day uh, come back and sit up here like uh, my guest today um, and, uh, and, get away and make a difference. Um, eventually, uh, making money is a lot of hard work. But uh, it's extremely rewarding one day to, to know that uh, you know, at the end of your journey, that you did something that really matters, and uh, hopefully today really matters. Hopefully you've enjoyed yourself. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and uh, go to our questions and, an and uh, answers. I know that uh, you guys are, are busy, but I want to make sure that we, we do take some questions. Yeah, Mitch, we have time for one question, and then I understand there's a panel here around for a few minutes. Yes. So we'll just yeah. some individual questions. So, does anybody have a question they would like to ask the panel? Sort of should they, could you elaborate a little bit more on that study you were talking about, the uh, mindset for success and then what uh, you would say the schools, the school system would teach you in terms of mindset? Sure. Uh, I, I'll give you a, real, a couple of really quick examples, okay? Uh, how many of you have ever uh, heard the expression, uh, money doesn't grow on trees? Yeah? You ever said it? Well, it's probably not a lot of parents because uh, when you become a parent, you start to repeat these things. And there's a there's a, a, a term for this. It's called a meme. A meme is like a, it's like a virus. When when you hear something, it, it infiltrates your brain. It takes over, and you start to spread it. And so, uh, a, a real uh, seemingly uh, non-threatening little thing like. Money doesn't grow on trees. When a kid hears this over and over again, it's usually at a time when they want something. And so they associate that expression, that little saying, that, that adism, which we then uh, even define as truisms, um, means something to them. Well, what does it really imply, if you think about it? It, it, it sort of implies um, scarcity, right? Money doesn't grow on trees means there's not enough to go around. Uh, and yet every successful entrepreneur that we've studied, every successful business person and, and innovator has the exact opposite mindset. In fact, I remember when I was in a, a business school and I remember a teacher literally drawing a pie chart and talking about marketing and how you're going to get your slice and if this was a, a soda discussion, uh, they'd say, well, Coke has this and Pepsi has this and what about RC and, you know, and they'd just say, how are you going to get your slice of this shrinking pie? But every successful person that I know and I've ever read about, they look at that same challenge and they say, wow, I guess it's time to make another pie. Mm -hmm. And then another pie and another pie. So the exact opposite mindset, the scarcity mindset, is what we have labeled everything is possible. Okay? And uh, I remember uh, Mitch interviewed uh, billionaire Richard Branson uh, 10 some odd years ago. He was already a billionaire, and Mitch asked him this question, if you had to do it over again, you know, what would you do differently? And one of the things that a billionaire answered, I, I happen to be, uh, you know, five feet away, he said, you know, if I had to do it over again, I would dream bigger. Think about that. A billionaire says he would dream bigger. That's because he embraces the everything is possible mindset. And we now know how billionaires dream bigger. They, they set up uh, tourism companies to, to take people to space for $200,000. So that's, that's one example. I'm going to give you the second one really, really fast. Uh, and, and that is, uh, when I was looking for a career, when I was looking for businesses to start, advice I would get um, you know, always had something to do with money, always had something to do with studying the trends. Where's the market headed? Uh, because you know, no one really wants to start a business where there's not a lot of opportunity. So this focus on money first, you know, if you're given the choice between two different jobs and they pay significantly different wages, you're probably more inclined to take the one that pays more. Advice from family and friends are probably, hey, find some security in your life. You know, choose a job that will pay you well. Well, what we found in studying the happiest people uh, and the most uh, financially successful is that they have the exact opposite mindset. They believe passion first. They believe identify what is true to you inside, your deepest passion, and then rearrange your life around that passion. 
Because think about it for a moment. When you do things that you love, you probably will do it longer than someone else who doesn't love it. You'll study more about it. You'll practice more. You'll put more time in. When you hit a roadblock, which we all know you will many times, when it's something you love, you're more inclined to find a way around it. When it's something you don't care about, when you're not passionate about, it's easy to give up. And so when you continually work on and study things that you love, and by the way, you probably have a smile on your face most of the time, the joke might be on the rest of us, like, hey, you do it for free because you absolutely love it. Well, when you add all of these things together, number one, you are happy in the moment. So happiness is not something to achieve. It's something that you uh, achieve as you're living your life. But the second thing that happens, what happens to people who tend to do things more than the next, who put more passion into it? They become not generalists, but specialists. They become experts at what they do. And nine times out of ten, the experts make more money than the generalists. And so typically, when you follow your passion first, money follows. But at a minimum, you're happy in the now. So that's an example of the one, opposing mindset. One question I just want to ask to so the group around passion. How many people here don't know what you're passionate about? Anybody not know what you want to do when you grow up? Um, the reason I ask that is, as much to Scott's point, what we often find, and I went through this, I was good at math and science. So, of course, everyone said I should be an engineer. And I was good at it. And I am good at it. But what we often find is that what you love and what you're good at don't have to be the same thing. Uh, just because you're good at something, people assume you love it, and they will push you to do it more and more and more. So you can be good at something and be very, and, and people will, around you will get you to do it more and more and more. So I have a trick for you to figure out what you really like to do. If you think about your to-do list each week, look at your to-do list over a series of weeks. Look at every Friday. The same things are always left on it. Those are the things you don't like to do. You may be good at them. In fact, I will tell you a secret. The ones that are always left on mine have to do with finance. I'm good at finance. I teach finance here. It's not my passion. If, I, if you gave me an hour on Monday, I am not going to choose to do my finance work. I'm going to choose to go out and meet with a new customer. I'm going to choose to meet with a new prospect. That's what I love. What I'm good at is something else. Now, ultimately, I've become better at what I love. But don't let people tell you that just because you're good at something that that's what you have to do. And the other thing is, your greatest idea may not be in the area that you're an expert in. I was a judge for the Adventure Prize last year, and I remember everybody saying, well, I'm a bioengineering student, so I have to come up with this idea. No, you don't. I'm running a water company, and I have an aerospace engineering degree. It doesn't mean I don't use my aerospace engineering degree, and I would, and I would study AE all over again if I could. I would, I would not do anything different. But don't pigeonhole yourself to think that just because that's your focus, that that's where your greatest idea has to be, and just because everyone tells you you're good at something and you should keep doing it, it's okay to be passionate in another area and find a way to combine those. Well, it's very clear that all four of you are passionate about what you're doing. Thanks so much for coming.